Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Snowball Wealth Podcast, where we talk about how to get out of debt and start building wealth, especially if you're the first in your family to do so. My name is Tanya Menendez, and today we'll be chatting with AJ, a Snowball Wealth community member who is rewriting his relationship with money and passing it down to his son. Welcome to the show, Anthony. Hi, Tanya. AJ. <laughs> it's okay. I told you just before we got on the call. Um, but yeah, thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to have this conversation and kick things off. Yeah. Well, first, I'd love to hear about your journey getting into tech and also just a bit about your background in terms of your history with money and maybe one of your first money memories. Ooh, first money memory. That's a good one. Well, I currently reside in Ohio, but I'm a born and raised Brooklynite. I grew up in, in Brooklyn, New York. So, you know, just being in a, in a metropolitan city like that um, and being what I considered low income, that in itself has its own challenges for sure. And then as far as me getting into tech, it was definitely a interesting and unconventional journey. I went to college uh, to be a lawyer. I was pre-law. And long story short, I found myself postgraduate um, in, in a non- in nonprofit working as a college access counselor for first generation students. So very nonprofit. And then part of that job saw me incorporating a lot of partnerships within the city, just kind of getting the students we were working with different opportunities throughout the city, whether it's scholarships, job opportunities. And one in particular was a free membership to City Bike. So obviously a bunch of low income kids never really probably have ridden city bike before because you see it, it's, it, it might be a sign of, of gentrification or there's a lot of, of caveats to it. And, and you're located in the Bay, so I'm sure it, like Bay Wheels is kind of a, a similar example for you. Um, and I know about Bay Wheels and I know about different uh, bike shares is because through that partnership, I actually started working for a city bike. I found out they were hiring. Their office was actually uh, at in the neighborhood where I grew up in Sunset Park. So one thing led to another, and I found myself being a program manager for a lot of equity-focused programming at City Bike, a lot of community-focused efforts to, again, get more low-income, more people of color, and more people who have different barriers to not just bike share, but to more healthy living throughout the city. It was kind of my job and my team's job to just kind of do some level setting with them and, and really understand what their needs are and how bike share could literally be a vehicle for them to get a job or be healthier living. So that was my first foray into tech uh, where I was working there and that uh, City Bike is a is operated now by, by Lyft and owned by Lyft. So that was kind oh. of my first foray into a larger tech uh, uh, firm. And then it was through that work where I found myself now. After three years, I then switched roles to be the manager of community programs at Brainly. So even though I'm in tech, I'm still doing a lot of community-focused programs, trying to bring people with different needs and kind of allowing them to see how our firm, the product, the, 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 the technology that we're building and using, how can that, again, be a tool or a vehicle for them to get something that they need, whether again, it's a job opportunity or at, the, at least in my company now, you know, help with homework or, or help with an exam or tutoring or things like that, or becoming a job as a tutor. So I try to use that mentality of really understanding what a community needs first, and then using where I'm at as again, an, an avenue for them to, to get what they need, even though that might not be what's printed on the masthead within within the company. I, I try to incorporate that in my work. Um, so yeah, that's a little yeah. bit about me. I love that because I also think that there's a lot of people that maybe grow up or they're first gen and they want to be able to give back. And But I think that this is a great example of like being able to give back, but also, you know, um, having a, you know, being also contributing to being in tech and being in this industry while still giving back, which is um, really awesome to hear. And I think we chatted about this earlier too. I think that, you know, growing up first gen, growing up, I think working or um, working class um, and not necessarily knowing what to do with your money, right? And I think that like this is a common experience of first gen college grads where you don't always know what to do or how to start investing. So I'm curious to hear like about your experience and how you got into financial literacy and um, and then also how you stumbled upon Snowball. 
Right. So you, you bring up a really good point where there's a lot of first generation college students or first generation, you know, I would say large scale earners within their family because you're college educated. That obviously increases your earning potential. So, you know, your, your parents say, I busted my ass to work my nine to five or all my three jobs so you can go to college. And then they actually see the results of their labor. It's great. It's great to see because so many of our parents may not have traditionally invested, but I would almost argue that their biggest investment has been their children. Now that comes with mm -hmm. the caveat mm -hmm. of, of, under true. of understanding oh, that. Oh, that's so true. <laughs> and what that means about these parents knowing how how their how their kids are doing, but yeah, I kind of found myself in that situation. Um, I'm undergrad. I have my master's now, so you know that that comes with again an, an increased earning potential. But earlier in my career, when I started seeing dollars that I've never seen before uh, for the work I was doing, I was definitely in that hole of what the hell do I do with this now and. I think the biggest kind of red flag or, or instance where I was like, I have no idea what to do with this was, as I mentioned, while I was at my, my last company at, at, at City Bike um, and at Lyft, I got equity for the first time. And I had no idea what to do with it. I did not know what the difference between uh, stock options, e, um, RSUs, exercising your options versus just letting it sit there, making sure you're not leaving money on the table. The fact that people, negotiate equity at the beginning of their uh, 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 interview process. And, and when they get offered a job, I didn't even know about a signing bonus, let alone, you know, having equity at the table. So that was something that was literally staring in the, me in the face, money that I had now owned and earned and not knowing what to do with it because it was also literally the first stock I ever owned. Mm -hmm. so that was kind of the wake up call where I was like, I don't feel, and the pandemic definitely catalyzed this tenfold where I don't feel well equipped enough to handle this the proper way. And the worst part is I felt like I didn't have really a group of people to go to for this because a lot of people are either in the same boat as mm -hmm. me or just don't, didn't know what to do with money or let alone new things about investing, about C, about certificates of deposit, about high earning in, uh, interest account or high earning savings accounts because these were just not conversations that happened around the dinner table. So I found myself in that situation. And again, the pandemic really increased that sense of urgency and also maybe a little bit sprinkle of panic because mm -hmm. of what was happening, especially financially with people losing their jobs, um, the, the, the stock market, you know, reeling down and, and just that being an, an, you know, North Star indicator for the economy as a whole. I may not have known about stock, but I knew that if the stock market is down, that is bad. <laughs> for some reason or another, that is bad because the Great Depression and the recession or whatever. Again, I knew that but very surface level. So that's what kind of propelled me and dove me head first into really diving in and 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 taking this seriously. And then what made it stick was just that I found it fun. I just found it fun mm -hmm. learning about these different elements um, about financial vehicles. Obviously, mm -hmm. you know, a big buzzword during the pandemic was crypto. And I have to admit, I jumped on the crypto bandwagon of just learning about it. Mm -hmm. But again, it was interesting to be a part of the conversation and, and being able to have it also with friends of mine, uh, which I can get to in a little bit and, and how that kind of kicked off and having conversations with friends of mine where we never really talked about finances. So it was a little bit of just things that were thrust upon me and then yeah. just the, the the needs of my environment and the needs of everyone's environment because we all had this shared experience for the last three years. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of what you shared resonates. I think that I remember I got my first, my very first job, full-time job was at Goldman Sachs. And I actually thought that they would provide some guidance around how to start investing because they're obviously a, a large financial institution. But when I got there as an employee, they never really told me how to manage my own money. They don't provide that as part of training or HR. And that problem still exists today, right? Like people don't really go through the training. You don't learn it in high school. You don't learn it in college. And then you don't learn it at, on the job either. So when do you learn this? And I think that, um, 
you know, I think that it's it's interesting because a lot of financial institutions, like robo advisors, for example, they assume that you're learning this from your parents or at the dinner table. But for so many of us, like m- literally millions of us, that's not happening. So it's really refreshing to hear your story and that like it's such a common experience even today. Um, and, and, so mm-hmm. and then it's intimidating because you feel like there's so much nomenclature, there's so much language you don't know, and then you meet that person at your job or at the lunch table that knows all the terms. Oh my gosh, yes. It's yeah. more intimidating to feel like you can't carry that conversation. So I mentioned before mm-hmm. that it was cool, especially during the pandemic where, you know, my different, my, my, my initial friend group, the friends I grew up in Brooklyn, again, friends I've never talked about finances mm-hmm. before, all found themselves in different buckets of fear. Maybe their earning potential increased. Maybe they didn't know what to do with their stimulus check. So that caused us to kind of come together. And I think this is what's really awesome and and honestly beautiful about Snowball Wealth is that you guys create these groups, especially if if, if people were like me, where we were afraid or, or weren't sure that our friends would be, you know, even interested in having these conversations because they it's not in their purview. It's not something they thought about. So why should they think about it now? Because also it's something they never talked to their parents about or their grandparents. So why start now? So that's why it's great to have groups online and and groups like Snowball where you can go find like-minded individuals, even more so individuals who have similar shared experiences that you do that you can really bounce things off of. Like when I was joining the mastermind classes or the mastermind group, something that did come up was just like money boundaries with your family. And it was Mm -hmm. so eye-opening how many people shared that experience and challenge of setting that boundaries with their parents, with their siblings, and even with their, their friends. So again, having a group to talk to about these things, not only calms your own fears and wor- and worries that you're not the only person going through this, but it also allows you to weed through some nonsense. And because there's just so much noise, especially as someone who is willing to learn, mm-hmm. it's hard to weed through the noise. Like, you don't want to pick up a 500 pound, very technical book or textbook or or novel, like, and, and go through that because it's very technical. And this is your first foray doing this. And you don't want to read Rich Dad, Poor Dad just because someone told you to. You want to find <laughs> something that resonates with you, you yes. know, finding Latino or, or Black focused financial writers is your you know, is what will kind of drive you because you're tired of listening to Dave Ramsey for the 15th billion time. (laughs) And that's, I think, also part of the trick, having people within your own circles to talk to and then finding what resonates with you. Again, like I said, what made it stick, why I still kind of look at financial things today is because I legitimately find it fun. I find the things that I find interesting and I giggle and I get giddy when someone says something about the economy that I agree with or disagree with. And I find it interesting. So I think that is kind of a key thing that people need to look for, that group, that caveat, whether it's your partner or a group of friends. And if you don't have it, find a group like Snowball uh, because they're set up to provide and give you that space to kind of, again, weed through the nonsense and weed through all the noise that you see online at the books that you were recommended by a colleague, through the podcast that you're not sure you want to listen to because it's three hours long, whatever the case (laughs) may be. Yeah, yeah. And a lot I mean a lot of what you just shared I think like also hits home for me, especially in that feeling of like not feeling like you can keep up with a conversation. I remember this moment where I asked my coworker like how much are you investing in your retirement? She was like, "Oh, I invest like 1% because I want to be able to spend on weekends." And then, you know, not really and not really knowing like what the right answer is when in reality when you're younger is when you should be trying to invest more because you can then, you know, increase your gains over time and compound interest and, and whatnot. But I think um, the other thing that's really interesting, too, is that, you know, college enrollment and the demographics around college enrollment are changing. So we're increasingly um, more women, more people of color are um, going to college. And I think having less of these communities that are just embedded within that Um, and that's why I think like, yeah, we're excited to like facilitate some of these conversations and just like create safe, like safe spaces to be able to ask questions and 
feel like, you know, your experience isn't isolated and you're not the only one that's going through this, um, which is really, really amazing to hear. And I'm so glad that you were able to participate and you got that out of it. Um, so I want to actually share and something that we like to do on the on the podcast is sharing practical advice. So you, I know that you mentioned to us that you recently have a new addition to your family. And um, so I'm curious to hear like what money moves you're making in order to build generational wealth for your future family. Absolutely. So as you mentioned, I, I have a new addition, not so new. Uh, we celebrated his one year birthday um, a couple of days ago. So uh, happy birthday, son. I hope you see this one day and say, oh, my dad was on the internet for a second. Um, But I think that's really important about the practicality of of what you're doing, because I think that's where some people kind of miss the buck when teaching their kids about finances is, is A, practicing what you preach and B, you know, having actual vehicles to to show your child. I mean, obviously there's a larger conversation about their genuine interests. I mean, I'm not going to show my one-year-old my stock portfolio, but on the same token, you know, I have a custodial account for him. So that's one practical thing that I've done. And like you said, time is on his side. He's one, you know, granted, you know, because of time, depending on how the market is, you know, there's a lot more opportunities for, for growth. So, the little things that I learn, like because time is on his side, maybe you can be a little bit more risky with your investments or maybe go moderate because of how the market is going right now. Maybe you don't want to be so gung ho and, and find just, you know, large cap growth index funds. And that's another thing, just like knowing the difference between ETFs and index funds. I now have a way to, again, practice what I've learned through my son. Am I saying I'm using my son's financial f- future as 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 kind of an experiment <laughs> um possibly but i think <laughs> that's the only way you're going to learn is to make those mistakes and if you're so afraid of making those mistakes and again you know asterisk disclaimer here only invest what you're willing to lose and that is true across the board and that is um true for for your family for a number of reasons but uh if you're worried about that hedge your bets and i have tried to hedge my bets with my son as well. He does have a 529 as well. Something again, oh, that nice. was, was, was new to me, uh, as someone who was lucky enough and, and, and well-rounded enough in school to get scholarships, to get financial aid, to pay for college. But if I keep on the trajectory of my earning potential, um, I don't know if I will have, if Louis will be, or if my son will be, um, able to to get those those same scholarships so i will have to pay out of pocket having that foresight also allows me to make those changes and then when he's at an age when i can have these conversations with him i think honesty and transparency is equally important um there are podcasts that i i listen to one of them that is great and if i can you know mention it here is called millionaires unveiled i think what's really cool about that podcast is it literally breaks down everyone's allocations um, as far as their assets are concerned. So it really also shed some light on what net worth actually means. And I think one interesting theme that has come out, and this is is more true for the people who have come on the podcast who are um, from from either black or brown uh, backgrounds um, or, or identify as such, is that they might te- try to teach their children financial literacy, but they've never disclosed how much money they actually have. Again, this is the Millionaires Unveiled podcast. Everybody who comes on the podcast has at least $1 million of net worth. So these are every, it's an everyday millionaire podcast almost. But I found that so interesting that they never share how much they actually have net worth wise to their children. And I, and people are very hot and cold about this conversation, same way couples are hot and cold about combining finances. Some couples think that they should, while others think they should have separate bank accounts. So having that honest and transparent conversation with my son is very key in him understanding, you know, uh, uh, money in general, being honest about our situation, being honest about my and his mother's upbringing financially and what that meant for us. Um, knowing the value of, of a dollar just because, you know, we spoil you doesn't mean you have everything um, that you could ever want, you know, and we, and we try to do that um, intentionally. So you know, practicing what you what you preach is is a key part of it. Then finding practical v- money tools, money vehicles 
um, money, financial products that you can actually pour into your um, to your children's future, because that is also how you're going to reinform your own learning. And for a group of people such like myself, who is kind of starting from scratch in their own learning, granted, I've been doing this for about two, three years now, but I am far from an expert. I'm still learning every single day. But having these vehicles to learn while also understanding the risks associated with it is the balancing act you need to kind of toe in order to eventually do what you need to do to set up your child's financial future. And then you start seeing growth, then you start seeing success, and then you have those validations that, okay, this was the right call. I need to mirror this in the future. For example, for me, that kind of aha moment was getting um, high yield dividend stock options and and going Mm -hmm. the um, REIT, the REIT uh, uh, Mm -hmm. route in my own stock portfolio. And I did that for my son's portfolio. And now a lot of those are some of our best performing holdings right now. So that was kind of my aha moment of, oh, I did research on dividends. I did research on REITs. I invested in it. And now I'm seeing dividends. I'm seeing also increased growth in the actual stock value itself. Mm -hmm. So you're going to make mistakes and and it's going to backslide. You might even backslide, but then you'll have that kind of aha moment. This is what I did right. Let's let's stick to that. Let's let's lightning in a bottle almost. (laughs) Yeah. And I actually, you know, if you're willing to share, would love to hear um, how you researched the REITs and how you decided on them. And maybe if you're willing to share what they are and what their names are and how to buy them. Yeah. So um, as I mentioned before, having a group of people to talk to about this was a key part of it. So I made a pseudo investment group with with a group of friends of mine from back in, in Brooklyn who are all still there. And, and quick disclaimer to those listening that this is not financial advice. This is yeah. just community <laughs> and meant to spark curiosity and conversation. So please do your own research. But, you know, mm-hmm. wanted to also you know, open up the conversation and have these open conversations right on the podcast so that people can start learning here. And, you know, we can save them a little bit of uh, searching on the on the internet and on uh, chat GPT. <laughs> so right. we're big now too. So, um, yeah. So is it, yeah, yeah. Wanted to give that quick disclaimer, but please go on. Absolutely. Um, and I'm glad you did that. And I think that's just a larger conversation in order to have these candid conversations in order to see people who look like us kind of get into that uh, confidence that they can research and 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 learn more about it is just having these candid conversations and I and I and I'm a firm believer of salary transparency. Um, mm-hmm. and that was and and having those conversations with my managers and and my colleagues was kind of eye opening. Like how much you're making, how much should I be making, and that kind of gave me a leg to stand stand on to do negotiating and learning mm-hmm. like I said earlier things about signing bonuses and things like that and and adding to the to the mental concept of just knowing your worth in general and i think mm-hmm. that's another struggle that a lot of people <laughs> in our in our bucket um tend to fall into just not knowing your your literal financial worth but i digress so um we started this group and we gave each other assignments at the end you research this you research that we'll come together we'll wait we'll kind of um sift through if you, if you mind me saying excuse my language we'll sift through the bullshit mm-hmm. kind of figure out what works for us and then we'll share how we've actually applied it in our own life so i got dividends and i got reits so i did um, my own research basically because i was new to this i had one month free of all the different seeking alphas motley fools and i you abuse that to the core every other day i got the apps i looked at articles i i exhausted all my free articles that i got but specific to what i was looking for i didn't i didn't mess around with crypto i didn't mess around with real estate like traditional real estate just um real estate investment trust are uh, reits so I, that's what i did and then i found ones like uh, Pine was one that that is is really interesting. Um, MPW is a medical one, um, and then they all just vary around, you know, commercial buildings, uh, uh, storage units, and 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 it's interesting because I I invested in this during the pandemic at a time when a lot of people were working from home, but I'm a firm believer of real estate as a viable investment option. Um, I'm 29 and and my wife and I uh, bought, we, I was adamant to buy our first home before 30 for that reason. Again, and then you can empathize living in the Bay Area as someone who grew up on rent <laughs> all his mm-hmm. life and the value of actually, or I'm trying to understand the value of owning something instead of paying 
uh, some landlord. But yeah, that's what kind of started that and and then going back to that group and just kind of again sharing what I learned to again not only share with them so they can use it, but also, and this is really important, reaffirming my own knowledge. I think people don't really mm-hmm. talk about that so much where you you start learning what it is you want to do or start learning the tools and the and the and the the terms and things like that, but not talking about it out of fear of knowing if you're actually you know what you're talking about. Just do it. Just talk about it. And, you know, talk it, talk about it to people who might know better at, better than you so so they can kind of not correct you, but just kind of find the gaps mm-hmm. and, and fill it. And then it just reaffirms your your own confidence. So when next time you go to lunch and, you know, uh side eye bro across the table is talking all about this, that, and this investment he made, you could be like, well, actually, and also cut in with something actually substantial to say. But again, it, it, it all boils back to practicing what you preach, but also having a safe space to kind of just kind of bounce those ideas, those new concepts off of. That's so critical yeah. in, in reaffirming your own knowledge. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, we experienced some of this when we, we launched an investing 101 mastermind group. And we quickly saw that we actually had to break it down into smaller segments because investing means different things to every, like everyone, right? There's many different interpretations of what investing mm-hmm. means. But overall, I think my biggest takeaway is that, and even in my own journey on, on learning um, about and diving into the financial services industry, it's like fin- like finance and fintech is like learning a new language. And it's, it's some, it can, it can take time to first understand just the main words that you need to know, the main components, how it works. And then you start putting together the pieces and adding complexity to all of the products and services that exist. But it is truly like learning a new language because you're learning all of the different products, how they interact how they you know grow over time and all of the different players and regulations and everything and taxes is a whole you know other specialty credit card turning is a whole subculture so there's a ton of subcultures within finance like you know fire, fire and retiring early churning and credit so there's so many really interesting subcultures and you touched on the real estate you know even real estate it's like real estate REITs which are the um the products that you can, the vehicles that you can, you know, purchase that invest in real estate on the market, but also it's just real estate in general is a whole nother like subculture. So it's been fascinating actually spending my time on this. And I think like my biggest takeaway is like for anyone listening, if you're feeling lost, it's totally fine. It'll I, my naive ass thought the first time I got equity, I was like, wait, you mean like diversity and inclusion? And they're like, no. <laughs> Wait, really? That's so- like, that was so removed that because of my career trajectory, I thought we were talking about like diversity. I was like, what does that have to do with finances? I thought we were opening an IPO. <laughs> like, why are we why are we talking about the I mean, I'm all for it, <laughs> but can you connect the dots? And then someone like had to pull me aside and was like, No, equity is another term for you know stock options and things like that. And I was like, is it? And I had no idea. So I'm, I'm right here with you. It's okay to, to make those mistakes. And we, we need to create the space where it's okay to maybe look a little silly sometimes. And that's the only way you learn. That is, that really is. And that's so real. I think that's like reminiscent of me when I was asking my coworker, like, well, how much do you contribute? And you feel kind of sometimes shy to ask them these questions, but that's the only way that you can actually get these answers. And that's a big reason why we also, you know, uh, with Snowball, we developed the like financial roadmap just to cover like, this is everything that you should know <laughs> that we wish we had known when we first started this. And um, so take a look at that first. Um, so I encourage everyone to take a look at that. Um, and it's free on the app. But I know we're right on time, but I'm curious to hear if there's any advice that you have for first gen college grads, for those trying to get into tech um and future fathers just like any last words of advice that you want to um that you want to share and also where people can connect with you i think that you you said it yourself when when you think about investing it's a wide spectrum of things you know especially now with again cryptocurrency 
uh, and mm -hmm. real it's estate another. people are, are playing around with it for the first time, not realizing the the physical and and and, and to not toll, but just commitment that it takes. Are you ready to be a property manager? Are you ready to deal with tenants? It sounds good on paper, but there's a lot of nuance that people don't talk about. But what people forget as far as investments is also investing in yourself. And I think mm -hmm. that also falls to the wayside when these conversations start to pick up and that goes double for your kids. It's not, there's no secret sauce, just like hang out with your kid. Like it's, 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 it, it makes sense. Like care about your kid's education. And I'm not just talking about when they go to their actual classroom, because as you mentioned, the conversations about like taxes, budgeting, investing, they don't happen there. So it's a combination of that. And then again, practicing what you preach at home and sitting down and having those conversations, the conversations that your parents didn't have with you. It's about having those conversations and then just spending time and finding those opportunities to reaffirm those lessons. And if you don't know something, teach yourself. And that goes back to anybody out there, first generation who are, who are trying to figure out how to get to that point, you know, just invest in yourself, you know, um, part of a great way to invest is increasing your earnings potential. So if you're undergrad and you're still in college, bro, finish, like make sure you finish, make sure you finish. If you can finish with honors, if you can get a double, ma uh, double uh, major, you know, have that ambition. If that's the driving force that, that, that motivates you, everything else kind of just falls into place. It trickles down. You identify what it is you don't know and identifying the problem itself and what you don't know is the hardest thing because everything else comes easy. So don't forget to ultimately invest in yourself. You, I, you can research this. If you can get a pandemic hobby like I did about learning about investing and, and, and genuinely find interest, that's all great. And, and please do that because that is what's gonna make it stick. But that doesn't mean anything if you also don't have the capital to actually move around and actually make, you know, play around with and actually make these decisions and mistakes. Mm -hmm. So increasing your earning potential, um, skilling up, which is dumb easy to do now with YouTube and just the, the, the change in this country around education, which we could do a whole nother podcast on. Yeah. But there's a lot of opportunities to learn more now than ever. And I'm excited for my son because, you know, he's going to just be kind of getting all these opportunities to learn more about tech in general, because he is going to be a kind of a product of tech. He's he's a tech generation just naturally, just because of the time he's born. So again, it's just it's for, for yourself, just don't forget to invest in yourself. You can learn this, you can learn that. But if you're not skilling up and increasing your earning potential, everything else will just feel a little flat. And you'll always fall back into that cycle of, I want to learn all these things, but it's intimidating and I don't know what to do. And you'll never learn until you find that stock, you buy it. And then you, you, and you, it's a company you care about because you, then you'll actually start tracking it and start tracking its performance. So that's another kind of quick tidbit. You can start, the people say, don't invest with your heart. I think that's bull. <laughs> For the first two, invest with your heart. Invest in PlayStation <laughs> if you're a gamer. Invest in Sephora if you like makeup and just see how it goes and, and, and just use that as learnings. Do a small amount. And then again, going back to your kids, it, borderline just if you hang out with them if you make them feel loved and and feel like you care about their brains and their development it does things like boost their confidence mm -hmm. and boosting their confidence can help them do things like build their confidence in making these financial decisions again give them the practical tools but also give them the soft skills too of confidence critical thinking and knowing how to put those two together because you were honest with them and you shared the mistakes you made when you were 16 years old and decided to buy the new Air Jordans instead of investing in, you know, your first uh, uh, Roth IRA. Mm -hmm. So I think those two things, ultimately, we could talk about investing all day, but if you're not investing in yourself, if you're not literally spending time and playing with your kid, it can ripple. Mm -hmm. and can yeah, ripple. And I think a big part of what you just touched on is I think growth mindset, right? I think that continuing to invest in yourself. And um, I think that it's funny, like I, I, I remember my very first investment, it was right after my first full-time job. And I, I'm a very much a learn by doer, but it was $10 into Honda. And I used E-Trade to do that. And you, you know, you can start with $5, you can start with $10 and whatnot. And maybe it was more, I think it was Honda was like 14 or 20. It was something under $50 that I spent the stock on. And it was because they crashed because of some, 
like PR thing that they had. And so I was like, oh, that sounds like a good idea that I'll buy them now that they're like on sale and cheaper. So that was my very first investment. And it really got me curious about following it and tracking it. And it really goes to show it, it only you can start with like under $50, which in New York, that's how much you spend on brunch sometimes. And, um, and so if you spend brunch and invest, like you can start and learning. Like, yeah. And on a book, like a book that for investing, rather use that, use the, um, if it's a learning opportunity anyway, knowing that I could invest this 50 bucks and never see it again. But I learned if it went down, I yeah. can discover why it went down. I can look at when I pick the 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 stock, I can learn what I don't know, like what the hell is a P and E ratio and look it up. And that's how those conversations start. How that's how that discovery journey begins. I love it. I love it. And I love that we we um, shared that as well. And so thank you everyone for listening to the podcast. And if you're interested in additional resources and courses, check out our mobile app in the app store. It's um, Snowball Wealth if you search in the search bar or online snowballwealth.com. Thank you so much, AJ. And um, I'm looking forward to hopefully having you back on the show as you hit another financial milestone. And um, maybe we can talk about, uh, I'm sure there's a ton that we can talk about more and like, um, being first gen and creating generational wealth. And so I really appreciate you taking the time to um, share your story and just the, really the beginning of it. Next time my three-year-old will join and he'll just give the, the conversation. Hopefully he'll know more than I do at that, at that point. So I'll have him just come on and, and share his financial journey. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It was great sharing and honestly reflecting on my own journey, especially like right I'm, at, I'm in the midst of it so and we all are we all are we never end this journey so thank you tanya thank you snowball for for your time it was a pleasure